Second. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy lives to join us. Some wonderful members of our community are with us tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to them. If you pop your questions in the chat, I'm happy to pass them on to our speakers throughout the meeting. First, we're lucky to have our superintendent, Dr. Roy Montesano with us. Dr. Montesano. Thanks, Alana, appreciate it. Hi, everybody. It's um, nice to see some of you, but thank you for showing up um, for the meeting tonight. <clears throat> Just have a quick uh, brief update to, um, to provide for you, first starting with COVID, because that seems to be the thing that we do these days. Um, just want to say that we're extremely fortunate that the, the number of cases that we've actually had are very, very low, uh, which is a real tribute to uh, our parents, our community for not only abiding by the vaccine rules, but the masks and everything else that uh, we have in place. Because I know we're, uh, as a district, where I think we're under 10 cases in total, which has really been tremendous. Um, the other thing that's helped us quite a bit is the uh, new quarantining rules that we um, are using based on the state and health departments do not require us to um, quarantine a lot of people. So, for example, if a student is, is vaccinated, even if they're exposed, they don't have to quarantine. If they have masks on, they don't have to quarantine either. And interesting to note is any kind of spread is not happening in school. You can tell by the numbers, most of the students seem to be that we've experienced are getting uh, COVID from either their parents or somebody from outside so far. So, I mean, for us, that's that's good news. <clears throat> As you all know, the vaccines are available now for anybody ages five through 11. I have received questions off and on about whether that's going to be mandated or what's gonna happen with that. You know, we take our direction from the county and health, uh, state health departments and I, uh, right now we have nothing that suggests that vaccines will be mandated from kids. Um, I know there's uh, a number of people who want us want to see us get rid of the masks uh, mandate as well in schools. And um, right now, uh, again, we take our direction. There's no movement on that. Although it wouldn't surprise me that come springtime, um, that's, that's something to be strongly considered once the state gets numbers on the number of students five through 11 are getting vaccinated. <clears throat> I meet every Monday with a group of superintendents and the county health officials and the county executive to talk about these things. Uh, we go over infection rates in the county, uh, see what's going on, et cetera. <clears throat> and as a group, we are trying to push the state to um, provide metrics for us. So it's based on data, um, similar to what Massachusetts and Connecticut are doing uh, regarding the mask mandate and what they're doing as one of the metrics is once 80% of the in population, including all students and staff reach, uh, have, have been vaccinated, then masks become optional. Um, but again, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just giving you that as a, as kind of the, what we are looking into, but nothing is coming out of the, the county or health yet that, uh, that impacts us just yet. Um, but we can, we continue to work with them because the goal for us um, is to have our kids in school and stay in school. So by whatever means we can do that um, and not have to quarantine and, and send kids out, we're going to do and try to try to root for. It's not really a, a debate for us whether vaccines are good, bad, or indifferent. Um, it's, it's really, it's not about that or whether masks should be worn or shouldn't be worn. It's about how do we best protect everybody and keep our kids in school. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna continue to push for. Um, on the facilities front, um, I know a number of elementary uh, folks are wondering what's going on with the NPR and the South Playroom, because we have well, those are the two spots we do not have back online yet. I will tell you, the, the flood did impact us quite a bit. We, as a district, sustained about $850,000 worth of damage, um, including two of the main, the main gym and the blue gym, our big spaces, first floor, et cetera, but also the NPR and the South Playroom. <clears throat> everything has been replaced except for those two spaces. And that was really due to uh, materials. We couldn't get materials um, delivered, but I am happy to tell, to tell you that all materials are now on site and um, they are starting to um, pick up the old floor 
And right now we're expecting, with fingers crossed, we're about three weeks out from opening both the spaces back up again. <clears throat> so once that's open, it'll give the elementary school a lot more flexibility where we can put kids, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, hopefully things go according to our plan. Uh, they're targeting a November 22nd date for opening the NPR. And so we're gonna so hopefully uh, get there very quickly. The nice thing is that because those spaces aren't being used, they can work in them during the, during the day and, and get it done rather quickly. Um, so that's pretty much it for me on the update front. Uh, again, we appreciate everything that you guys do for us on a daily basis. Um, and thank you for joining us. And if we don't get a chance to uh, see each other again, happy Thanksgiving to everyone and uh, enjoy tomorrow's Veterans Day as well. Thanks, Alana. Thank Thank you, Roy. I've heard from so many parents about how happy their kids seem this year, how it feels closer to normal. So thank you for all you do to give that spirit to the, to the year. It's a good team effort, so thank everybody. The Board of Education is also working hard as usual to make sure that our children have the best possible learning environment. BOE President Arlene Thomas is with us tonight. Thanks, Arlene. I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thanks, Alana, and welcome everybody, and thank you for your passion for our school. I just wanted to spend a few minutes sharing with you what the board is working on. Um, and so what happens in October of each year, we do a long-term planning workshop um, that is open to the public. And we really take an evening where we stop and think about what are the issues that we're facing short-term and what are the long-term issues that we're facing. So I thought I would cover three of those issues with you tonight just to give you a flavor for, for what, it, what it's feeling like these days. So first I wanna cover supporting the students academically and emotionally. And second, our strategy around inclusivity. And then last, a few brief comments on our financial strength. So the first one, is the importance of keeping our kids um, academically um, challenged and emotionally healthy. So we do a variety of assessments, or actually, actually the teachers do a variety of assessments. Trust me, the board, board would not even begin to tread in that space. But we do a, they do a variety of assessments that allow us to track our students, not only against our, within our school, but also within our, our county, within our state, and even internationally. And everything that we're seeing so far from the 2021 year shows that our students are on track with where we expected them to be in their learning. Like many aspects of our lives, we recognize that we have lost a lot in the last year and we're trying to find a new normal. So I would really ask you if you feel like your child did fall behind in their academic learning in the last year, please make sure you're reaching out to your teacher especially in the elementary school level, you just don't wanna fall behind because there's so many things that are building on each other. So please, if you have any concern that your students are um, lost some learning in the last year, please make sure you're having that conversation with, with your teachers. We're also um, involved in something that I think is really dynamic. That is all three of the schools are working with a group called Inrusk. And they're a not-for-profit slash educational consulting firm that is helping the three schools understand what innovation came out of the pandemic that should be kept. And in other words, what was the good that came out of the last 18 months? So in a way that some of the things that we're learning is that the educators have noticed that they have changed. Um, they, especially in the elementary school, they talked about the fact that there was some rigidity on how they wanted to do things. They wanted the classroom to be perfect and, and whatnot. And they realized that they could work in a different way and be more flexible. So there are many things like that that the teachers are learning and it's that innovation that we will move and move and carry forward with us. And I do have to take a moment and really thank the Bronxville School Foundation for their support in this area. It's been great that they have funded the work that we have done and um, a grant is before the board next week about work that they will do in the future. And also we are continuing to work on our social emotional learning with our students. Um, now more than ever, we need students that are compassionate and empathetic. So second on the issue is the board is our conversation about inclusivity. So New York State provides the standards and the framework that we have to work under. So a lot like what Roy said about the, the COVID issues, a lot of, almost like 
it feels like 80 or 90 percent of our direction comes from the state and we just apply it here at the local level. So what's happening in this area is that Mara Kepke, who is the assistant superintendent for curriculum, has been working on a strategy for the, for the district. And she's been taking the board on that journey. In fact, we had a DNI workshop last spring as well that was open to the public for that people to come in and listen and participate. The key takeaway for me is always that we are here to help our students learn to think. We're not here to tell them what to think. And our strategy is very much grounded in the Bronxville promise in that we support our students to be leaders, to be innovators, to be engaged citizens, and to be critical thinkers. As with all learning opportunities, how you educate varies by grade. So for as an example, in middle school, they're focusing on vulnerability and differences. And they're also exploring new ways in which to have those conversations. In high school, they're focusing on civil discord. How do you have a conversation um, that is constructive and challenging? So that gives you some just examples of work that we're doing in that area. Lastly, I just wanna to touch on the financial strength of the board. That is something we talk about each and every board meeting. We are in a strong financial position and you have our commitment to keep it that way. The budget cap does create challenges for us, but to date we've been able to manage those challenges and we're able to present the community with a budget that honors that cap each year. So like Roy, I'd like to say thank you ever so much for your contribution to the school and for caring and being involved. And with that, Alana, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Arlene. I love hearing how we're thinking as a community about where the kids are really, you know, after the pandemic and also what we've all learned about the silver linings of educating the kids. Yeah, there's been some, I think we're going to find some really neat positive things are going to come out of COVID that we will benefit from decades to come. Thank you so much. Dr. Montesano, there's a question in the chat that I'll just pose to you now. Yeah, I um, see it. I, I can actually read it. Okay, so, great. But, but thank you in case anybody else um, cannot read it. And I, I want to thank the person for um, reminding me to talk about the testing program it was on my list of things to do. And then I forgot. <laughs> so thank you. So um, as, as you, you may be aware, we've talked about um, our requirement to test randomly 20% of our in-school population um, as we move forward. Um, you'll be receiving, I'm hoping on Friday, a letter to the parents kind of uh, discussing how the um, testing program is going to work. Right now, we're currently scheduled to start it next week. And our first test next week is going to be a gateway test, meaning everyone who has provided consent to us <clears throat> will be given a test to take home. It's a saliva-based test. Um, they'll be dropping off, or they may have already dropped off the testing kits. And at the elementary school, I believe we're going to be um, handing them out in classrooms. Uh, again, for those uh, students we have consent for, students are asked to you know put them in a backpack, take them home. There'll be instructions with for the parents on how to complete the saliva test. You bring it back to school the next day, and 24 hours, uh, we should have the data. <clears throat> it is my understanding, at least from the company, that parents will be, uh, I think it's through via email, if not a portal, I'm not sure which yet, but we'll straighten that out, will be notified um, when there is a negative test. If there's a positive test, our nurses get notified, and you will receive a phone call uh, because they want to make sure that we track that appropriately. But um, for any negative test, you'll be received, um, again, a, a, an email, or you'll have to be asked to go to the um, portal, but I think it's going to be via email. <clears throat> so that after next week, then uh, we're going to test students randomly um, to try to reach our 20% requirement. Uh, percentage of consented to random testing, um, as a percent, I'm sure we're probably about in 35% that have consented. So one of the things we're actually looking at now <clears throat> um, is we don't want to overtest any one child and have, you know, because we have lower consent rates, we want to meet, meet our 20%. But don't forget the 20% also includes staff members who will be testing, who've, who've uh, provided consent. Any staff member who is not vaccinated will be automatically included every week in the test 
It also includes our uh, custodial staff or security staff, uh, people like that. <clears throat> so it's not just students. Um, so 20% for us is probably gonna be around that 300 number uh, that will be required to do each week. So we're gonna try to be very um, smart about uh, how we go about the randomized selection of students. So again, we're very cautious of not over testing any one student. 35% uh, feels low, is it worth resending? Well, we can resend something out again. Uh, I have no issue with that at all. Um, we'd like to get the numbers up. Um, I, I know, at least I've heard from some that they were concerned about Friday consent because they're concerned about false positives that might have their child be uh, out of school. Based on um, the test and other districts that have, are, have started doing the test, the false positive rate is like 0.001%. So I'm not very concerned about uh, too many false po positives coming out. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's not, not likely. Uh, the benefit of random testing is really just a benchmark um, check on what's going on to see. <clears throat> I think they're look, we're looking for any kind of spread that might happen, uh, just kind of checks and balances. So you, you, it's not feasible to test everybody every week, especially for those who've been vaccinated. Um, so the idea, I guess, is by 20% randomly, you just, again, doing these random checks to see if there's anything out there uh, that we need to be aware of and any particular spread that we have to be concerned about. Um, but again, you'll be receiving more information on, on the logistics of the testing on Friday, and we're going to move forward next week. But thanks for bringing that up for me. And Roy, this was all done under the auspices of the health, the Westchester health, County Health Department, correct? They're, they're funding this activity? It, it's not, well, the, the state is funding it. Every county yes. received um, funding from the federal government, actually, to do the testing program. So, yeah, it's not something that the district has to pay for. It's something that is done through the, uh, the COVID funds that each state had allocated to them. Thanks. Sure. Okay, let's turn to our elementary school principal, Mr. Joe Mercora, who has survived his first few months with us and is going to share his thoughts on parts of the curriculum in the school. Joe? Thank you, Alana. And it's, it's been more than survive. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be here with everyone. And I just want to mention a few of our staff members that are joining us tonight, our wonderful reading specialist, Rosanna Colinatis is here. Christine Dowd, who works in our special education, is here tonight. Derek DiRienzo, who's going to be talking a little bit about our student council later, is, is here. And the best assistant principal in no, any school in the world is here, and that's Ms. Rakia Adams. So I want to just give them a special hello and thank them for being with us tonight. Uh, it's my job tonight to have a, a wonderful conversation and show you some of that great work that is being mentioned and how our students have demonstrated that resilience. And I just wanted to start out a little bit by focusing this presentation a little bit more on our academics. So in terms of supporting our teachers, I'll speak more about math in an upcoming elementary school council meeting, but we've had Greg Tang uh, visiting with our teachers, uh, developing our math instructional practices. Uh, our science program, which you'll see a little bit about tonight, is back in the lab, and uh, you're going to hopefully enjoy seeing some of the work that the students are doing in action. Uh, we have had a phenomenal relationship with the, our teacher college consultants, and they have been visiting actually in person and as well via Zoom uh, with our teachers to help them with their ELA instruction. But something to kind of start off on tonight is the teaching of phonics that occurs uh, formally in K-1 and 2. Uh, just to review with everyone, phonics is uh, a curriculum that we have here that's research-based and it's drawn from the work of the top experts in the field. Uh, it's about developing students' phonemic awareness, uh, teaching students to explore language, to blend phonemes into words, rhyming and playing with language. Uh, children then go on to learn the alphabet, uh, the letters, names, sounds, formations. They then develop the understanding of what word families are, digraphs, and just learn the blends of short and long vowel sounds and high frequency words in each grade. Um, the programming is engaging and there's a storyline and a mascot attached 
to each one. So uh, for example, we have Rashid the Lion in first grade and Gus the Dragon in second grade. And I was just in a first grade class the other day where Rashid appeared uh, on the smart board and they went into an entire discussion on a particular topic that they were doing in literacy that particular day. So it's very exciting and it's very fun. In terms of the structure of the lesson in phonics, it usually starts off with a short mini lesson followed by group or independent practice. Uh, and again, it's closely and smartly aligned with our reading and writing units, and it gives us a better chance to, to students to transfer the skill and to see how the students are doing. We have tremendous assessments that allow us to track the student growth to just, just to go back to what Arlene was saying, it allows us to see if students are in fact where they need to be in terms of a particular year and allows us to plan a targeted intervention for students that may not be where they need to be. Uh, teachers use this assessment data to plan their individualized differentiated instruction for students. Uh, I wanna take you through a little journey, K to five, and it will be a brief journey, I promise, but it's an exciting journey. So we've just gotten through Halloween and uh, we're on to Thanksgiving and obviously pumpkins are a big thing and our kindergarten students have become experts on measuring the circumference and heights of pumpkins, uh, learning to see if pumpkins sink or float. And obviously with Thanksgiving, a big theme that is happening is thankfulness and to have gratitude. Uh, there's a particular emphasis with the students on sharing and caring. Uh, and we use literature to springboard our classroom discussions. Our children continue to use, in terms of reading, their storybook readers. They're reading a lot of familiar books that a lot of us know. Uh, Caps for Sale is one of my favorites. Uh, and also they're working with their reading partners. So that collaboration is going on again, where they are retelling the stories using their character voices. And if you ever want to get engaged in a story, watch a kindergarten student go through a story using the different sounds that they believe the character is using. It's very engaging and it really keeps them very interested. In studying uh, phonics, the students are actually finishing up their name study where they take a close look at each child's name. And it's a culminating wonderful experience speaking with that theme of inclusivity and allowing students to just feel connected to one another. The students will actually be making friendship necklaces for a classmate with the child's name on it and giving it to them as part of a Thanksgiving uh, presentation and gift. And when the students leave the classroom, they get to make their way to all the different specials classes, which they were not able to do last year. And uh, we're gonna focus a little bit this presentation on science. So they are back in the lab and the kindergarten for the fall uh, is working on the study of trees and plants. And you know, as you can see, back to pumpkins, they're dissecting a pumpkin, they're observing rings on tree rounds, and they're looking at roots and how they absorb water. And you can see it's hands-on, they're working together, uh, they're exploring, and they're able to do things this year in a science lab that they were not able to do last year. And they've bounced back beautifully into being back in that science lab and conducting those experiments. So first grade, uh, we just celebrated the publishing of their personal narratives and the students shared them and we celebrated that as part of uh, their, you know, their writing experience. Uh, they're using their knowledge to be good citizens and part of being a good citizen is being a welcoming person to all people that you come into contact with. And again, it's also in line with our B3 being safe, being responsible, and respectful to others. Um, the students have been enlisted by the super secret agency. And each day the class is given a mission uh, uh, of work to do during their reading and phonics workshops. It develops their skills and it certainly engages them and makes it very interesting for them to have those conversations, dialogues and create that work. When our first graders become scientists, they are right now in a great study of insects and their interesting life cycles. And they are observing, they are observing mealworms. And they're so excited about their observations of mealworms and recording those observations. And they're so excited about it that they are quick to speak about it in atmospheres such as recess and uh, walking in the hallway. They're just very excited to have that hands-on learning approach again towards science. And they're just responding to it. So moving forward to second grade, they just finished a beautiful narrative writing unit and we're celebrating the students writing uh, just by making sure that we're acknowledging work that was uh, put together by the students. 
and uh, making sure that we are sharing that with each other and collaborating with each other, with the students, with each other on the works that they've created. Completed their first problem-based learning unit for social studies, where the students actually determine their class values. What is our class value? What is important? And again, making sure that all students are respected and welcome is a big part of that value of a class. And they're creating class rules that reflect those values. And again, aligning it to be safe, being responsible and being respectful. I also wanted to just uh, thank Mayor Marvin and Chief Satriali Bronxville for allowing our students to have a virtual tour of Village Hall. And I actually was able to sneak into one of those uh, tours and hear the second graders uh, have conversations. And the conversation was rich and, and really uh, thank you to our mayor and our chief for really being good sports and answering all of their questions. They were very excited to meet them. Uh, in terms of their scientific exploration, they are studying woodland and freshwater habitat. So really that's the observation of plants and being able to draw and diagram uh, the different plants, uh, the, the terrariums that they are working on and meeting uh, you know, different creatures and objects working with those uh, on their incredible journey. And if and you see it, listen, the picture speaks way better to it than I can. Just having that engagement and that hands-on approach and they're learning, as a res learning so much better and as a result of having that opportunity. Um, the third graders, these are our detectives. They have been reading mystery books, and they are on a mission to be co-detectives, supporting one another in finding evidence in the reading to make strong predictions. And it's really just a great thing to see in a classroom when the students break into their detective groups and they're able to collaborate. They are, of course, keeping a safe distance, but they're working again collaboratively with one another to make predictions about what they're reading about in the text. And again, sticking with that theme of just being respectful and inclusive to all that are around us. Part of their social studies unit is studying about the holidays and festivals celebrated in selected, each selected world community and kind of doing a comparison to them of the holidays and festivals celebrated in their own. So it's bringing the world to them and making the world a little smaller and making them have a better understanding of the different celebrations that happen throughout the world. Our third grade scientists are well into a study of the structures of life during this fall season. And in particular, the study and care for crayfish. So it's, it's uh, studying, uh, and it's actually mimicking the natural habitat that the crayfish lives in, in the classroom. And it's observing the structures and the behaviors of those crayfish. So it's really fun to see. And we're trying to bring that visual to you so you can experience it a little bit yourself. In terms of our fourth grade, and we're so lucky to have Mr. DiRienzo here, but uh, just they are really knee deep into an exciting unit that they always get excited about this time of year, their Native American unit of study. They were one of our grades that were fortunate enough to, tend to attend a field trip that was fully outdoors. And a big shout out to Mr. DiRienzo for working that out where we were actually able to take the students on a good old fashioned field trip. Um, that was really, uh, if you've ever been to Ward Pound Ridge, it, it really focuses its study on the Algonquin tribe and how they utilize their environment. Uh, they further were able to uh, arrange a virtual trip to the Iroquois Museum, and um, they, it's adding a new experience that's hopefully enhancing this unit even further. Uh, they'll be constructing a wigwam or a longhouse in the future, and we're looking forward to those constructions. In terms of ELA, the students recently just started a new unit in reading and writing, and they are beginning um, to work on, you know, the structure of an essay's writing, working on a focus of personal issues that are important to them, such as friendships and siblings. And the students are going to turn that into a persuasive essay. And we're very excited to see what work uh, they will come up with as a result of that. In reading, specifically, they're studying nonfiction and they're working in groups to explore a topic of choice. Our fourth grade scientists are studying this fall, the growth and development of flowering plants. So they're actually doing some dissecting of seeds and they're studying the pollination of flowers as well to see how that transforms the flower and grows. And the conversations that are had, obviously as we get older and older, the work uh, requires a lot more higher level of critical thinking. And it's amazing how they've been able to adapt to that level after not being in a science lab for an entire year. Uh, and again, it's hopefully the visuals are 
showing that to you. Our fifth grade, I, I mentioned fifth grade just because we do a little bit more of a departmental approach to fifth grade, because if you've ever read Turning Points 2000, which is a big mantra for middle level education, one of the recommendations is for fifth graders to start working in more of a team approach with teachers. So we team our fifth graders into teams where they're working with a couple of teachers in different subject areas. And what that does is it allows the middle school transition to not in any way be overwhelming to them because you know, for the better part of their kindergarten to fourth grade experience, other than specials teachers, they basically had one content teacher in their classroom, one homeroom teacher. So exposing them to different teachers in different subject areas really helps that middle school transition go that much more smoother. Uh, in math, I've, I've just been uh, blown away with uh, the work that they've done in addition, subtraction. And right now they're dealing with the multiplication and division of fractions using models and algorithms. And in particular, using different algorithms and using algorithms to um, solve the same problem, different algorithms to solve the same problem, and actually being able to report back on what algorithm they found most useful. And uh, sometimes it's the easier one to use, but sometimes it's the one that was able to make them understand the problem that much better. So it, that's a, a real tribute to their critical thinking and math that's happening at the fifth grade level. In reading, they're studying complex nonfiction, recognizing multiple main ideas and writing a summary of what they're learning to use and determine the meaning of new words that they're learning. So increasing their vocabulary as well. They've become quite the journalists writing news articles and feature articles. And in terms of just their citizenship, I felt it very necessary to mention that the fifth grade has a series of spirit days that are usually focused on some type of a great cause. And they've recently had a lapathon last Friday and they raised money for a school and orphanage in Tanzania. And our fifth graders alone were able to raise $2,700 for that orphanage and school in Tanzania. And I think that really deserves to be applauded because it shows their global citizenship coming out. Um, They're studying, obviously with fifth graders, they are studying scientific variables they're conducting controlled investigations and collecting data on those particular investigations that they're working on. And it's been the conversations and the dialogue that goes on is just so rich and so meaningful. And the collaboration is just, you know, it's a, it's a real pleasure to see that happening again. Uh, whereas last year, we weren't able to do as much collaboration with the students and have them in these type of settings. Uh, in all schools, not just, of course, this school, but in all schools. So it's great to see this in action right now. Um, I want to just give a real shout out to our elementary science teachers, Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Monaco, who are so happy to be back uh, in there, enjoying their investigations, uh, hands-on learning that's happening. But in particular, all of our K-5 teachers for just a little bit of the sample of the work that's happening that you've gotten tonight as part of this presentation. Uh, they're doing a phenomenal job and students are reacclimating back to school uh, in a great way and uh, doing some great work, as you can see as well. Um, Parent-teacher conferences, I think the most important thing a parent always wants to know is, how is my student doing? How is my child doing? And we've had the opportunity this month to have individual student progress being discussed. Uh, it has been discussed or it's still being discussed. We have other conferences today and we have our Next round on Friday, we're getting out at 1130 again for those conferences to occur. And I, I, the conversations have been wonderful and, and we've been that we're going to keep that ongoing, of course, throughout the school year. Uh, just to, again, reiterate what Arlene said was something I was going to say as part of this presentation. Whenever you have any questions or concerns, please never hesitate to reach out to your child's teacher. That's what we're here for. And uh, we'll always get back to you as soon as possible and be happy to have that dialogue with you about your child, which we know is the most important thing to you. And we take that very seriously as well. Um, COVID update, Dr. Montesano just said it. Uh, Alana always asked me to give a quick update as well. We've only had six cases this entire year. And as Dr. Montesano said, they've started out basically primarily with um, four, four of them have actually been a parent testing positive and it trickling to the children. Um, uh, I wanted to say to you that from my, you know, big shout out to the parent community, Proactivity and cooperation has just made all the difference uh, in allowing us to um, combat this and work with this. So thank you for that. And Alana, thank you so much for this time that you give me. I tried to keep it short, but it's exciting work. And I, I think it's we need to all hear about it. 
Thank you so much, Joe. I know that parents really appreciate hearing all those details and they've enjoyed getting to know you over the, the past few months too. Thank you. Now to one of my favorite parts of the elementary school, the student council. The faculty advisor, who's also an adored fourth grade teacher, Mr. Derek DiRienzo, was kind enough to join us tonight. Derek, can I throw it to you? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for uh, allowing me to be here. I'm very excited to address this meeting and give uh, some information about the student council and obviously answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, I've been advising the student council for a number of years at this point. Um, it has grown a lot uh, in the past you know, five or six years. Uh, it's a very exciting experience for the students. Originally, just to give you some background, um, the student council was open to fourth and fifth graders. But when COVID came around, we decided we had to, well, the opportunities for them to engage in community outreach decreased because of COVID, unfortunately. So this year, it's only open to fifth graders, um, which was okay because last year, these students who are now fifth graders were fourth graders and couldn't do it. So we did a, um, I asked them to write an essay explaining what would make them a good candidate for student council and what they have done in their community in the past to make them kind of understand what's important about the experience. And then because it's not really necessarily a writing assignment, I just put all the names in a hat and then randomly pick two students from each class um, in the fifth grade. So I ended up with six students this year. It has been different in years past. We used to do kind of a um, two boys and two girls type of thing, um, but we stopped doing that for the you know, understandable identity reasons. So I ended up choosing 12 students for the first half of the year, 12 students for the second half of the year uh, for a total of 24 students to kind of get as many kids um, involved as possible. So just to give you guys an idea of some of the things that we do, I, I made a little graphic for you. So uh, just some of the biggest, bit, uh, some of the big ticket items we do Student Council um, sponsors the Memorial Day logo contest, which happens in September, October, and the logo is chosen for the Memorial Day Fair, which happens in May. We do an annual Thanksgiving food drive, which we donate the food to the Westchester Food Bank. We do a holiday toy drive and we partner with Toys for Tots annually. We do Valentine's for Veterans, which is a program sponsored by Soldiers Angels. We run a walk to school week, which is in tandem with earthday.org. And then a couple of years ago, we started doing a teacher appreciation week. Those are not all of the initiatives that we take part in. Those are just some of them. Each year we try to um, launch or pilot something new. It depends on kind of like what comes up or what suggestions we get from either the students themselves, who I do ask them for their input and I have them brainstorm ideas. A lot of times I'll have parents from the community give us suggestions. Sometimes teachers from the school have something that they think might work. The student council reps also do classroom visits. So anytime we have an initiative, like for example, we, uh, Mr. McCora mentioned that this month's school theme is gratitude. So we're gonna make a gratitude tree outside of Miss Adams' office. We're gonna have all the kids cut out little leaves and write something on the leaves that they're grateful for. And so when we're gonna do something like that, that's a school-wide activity, I send the student council kids with the script to a number of assigned classrooms. So they get to go and address their fellow classmates, whether they're kindergartners, first graders, or fifth graders, or their peers and they can explain to them what the activity is, what the importance behind the activity is, and then they can also act like a, as a liaison between me and other teachers. So those classroom visits and those speeches are actually building independence within this core group of students. I do put a lot of responsibility on them uh, as it pertains, you know, if you think about their age level, but they 
you know, meet the expectation that I have and they love it and they get into it and they do a great job of it. Um, they also take part in our B3 assemblies. Most likely Miss Adams will give, you know, say a, a three out of the 12, um, each of them will get a role in the current B3 assembly and they'll get to address the entire student body all at one time, uh, which to them is actually the most exciting thing I think about being part of student council. Um, and then also when we're doing things like the food drive or teacher appreciation week or walk to school week, we also did the candy drive for Halloween. We helped out Ms. Fosak. A lot of them will be assigned morning, morning duty. So they'll have to get to school a little early at eight o'clock and then they'll stand out there. Either they have signs for walk to school week or they have boxes for the food drive or the candy drive and whatever it is that we're doing. So it also is increasing their level of responsibility outside of the school day. And that makes them feel really special, but it's also kind of introducing them to the fact that sometimes your responsibilities actually happen outside of what you perceive to be the hours of when you're supposed to be on. Um, so I do think that that's really helpful as well. So just in terms of um, what I hope for these students to accomplish is an increased level of responsibility, an increased level of independence, and also an increased level of knowledge about the need of other people. And, you know, a, a really big, um, a really common thread in education right now is the idea of service learning. And community outreach is obviously a one major component of service learning, and they are definitely getting an education in that. They also, you know, at some point in the school year, they'll visit the other classrooms and talk about how can we decrease pollution? How can we um, increase kindness? How can we increase accepting of others? How can we help new students who are new to the district or new to the school? Um, so there's honestly countless things that we can do. And of course, I'm open to anybody's uh, suggestions. If anybody in the community has something that they think we can accomplish or has an organization that they think we can partner with or even has a person or a family or something that they feel is in need. Um, I'm absolutely open to any suggestions that you might have. I can't promise that we can do all of them, but I am a, I'm, I'm a doer. I'm a very ambitious person and I am absolutely on board to give anything a try. Uh, the group of kids that I have right now are awesome. Some of them happen to be my former students or their siblings were my students and so on. So I'm getting to know them well. Um, and we're, we're having a great time and it's an awesome experience for all of them. And um, I hope that the community feels and um, can identify with all the hard work that they're doing because I do think that it's really special. And I do think that to experience this level of community outreach at such a young age is gonna really help to kind of deliver awesome, you know, citizens to our community when they get older. Thank you, Derek. The kids are so lucky to have you. I'm Thank curious, you. do you see some real transformations in the kids? Like maybe, you know, someone who might be really on the shy side really becomes more comfortable just with leadership. I yeah, I do. And it's interesting because um, I, I remember one very special experience. And I obviously I won't use any names, but I had a student who was in student council and he really was uncomfortable speaking in front of people because he didn't like his accent. And, you know, we talked a lot about it and it just turned out we, I needed all of them for a B3 assembly. And I told him, I said, I need you to do this. And he was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do it. I don't know if I want to do it. And I'm like, you can do this. I, I promise you can do this. And honestly, it was one of the best experiences he ever had in elementary school we put him up on the stage in the auditorium in front of the, the whole student body. And he, he just, he like came out of his shell. What you would have never known that he had any reservations about being on a stage in front of a lot of people. 
And, you know, it was an awesome experience also for me and for his mom and for him, it was just something very special. But in addition to that, I do see those transformations every year. Um, and that's one transformation going from maybe not wanting to speak in front of people, but then also maybe not wanting to be the center of attention, maybe not having the level of responsibility. You know, I give them, again, they're, they're little, so I give them a stack of papers and a stack of materials. That's actually, for them, that's a lot of stuff to keep track of in addition to their school materials. And so I give them this stuff. So they have to hold on to it, keep it in a safe place, not lose it. They're responsible for doing it to other teachers. Other teachers are depending on them, showing up on time. These are all just kind of little skills that we're kind of, you know, we're giving to them or, you know, putting upon them that they're not used to. And I will say that 99% of them rise to the occasion and rise to the challenge. And I have them come back to me years later and say, oh, student council was so fun, or I'm running for student council in middle school or high school and so on. So I absolutely do see transformations in them. Um, and I just think they're really good skills for them to be experiencing at this age. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been an awesome experience. Thank you. Um, next up is Amy Kraus, who's a dedicated parent volunteer who works with the Bronxville School Foundation. Amy? Thanks, Alana. Good evening, everybody. The foundation's annual community drive has begun, so by now school families should have received the community drive mailing from the foundation. As so many of you know, foundation grants have been instrumental in providing resources to the school to help navigate the challenges of the pandemic. And the foundation board continues to work with the administration and faculty to identify new needs and best practices in our evolving learning environment. The foundation relies on the support of our school families, the local community and alumni to fund these important resources. So we hope you all will consider making a donation. To maximize your contribution, we also hope you will check the matching gift programs in your household. Our goal is 100% participation from school families. We also have the Katie Welling Run Walk coming up, and this event is traditionally held on the Saturday of the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Given COVID-related restrictions, Katie's Run Walk will be virtual again this year. For maximum safety and flexibility, we invite participants to run, walk, or bike at any time from November 15th through the 30th. Walking or running on a treadmill or riding on a stationary bike at home are also great ways to participate. Please register to participate on the Foundation's website. There's no fee this year, but a tax-deductible contribution would be welcomed. All donations will benefit the Bronxville School Foundation. And finally, we've had two recent off-cycle grants this year that have stemmed from grants that were approved and implemented last year. Based on the success of the high school's outdoor musical last spring, the school decided to stage another outdoor production this fall, hopefully you saw at the Crucible. And the foundation again provided funding for a sound engineer and the rental of audio equipment. The production and the sound quality were really amazing. In addition, feedback from the elementary school faculty using the front row sound systems, which hopefully you have all heard about in the elementary school, has been so positive that the foundation approved a grant to purchase the systems for the middle school classrooms as well. Thanks, Alana. Thanks, Amy. Do you wanna go right into telling everyone about the teacher appreciation luncheon? <laughs> Absolutely, why don't I just do it all at once? Um, so on October 19th, the PTA served over 290 box lunches from NetMeg to the teachers and staff in the elementary, middle, and high schools that we would have liked to have hosted our teachers and staff with an in-person luncheon. Because of COVID, this was a contactless event set up in the auditorium atrium. Our understanding, though, is that it was still very well received. The teachers and staff really love these opportunities to get together as a community, and we remain very hopeful that we will be able to be back to our normal in-person luncheons in the spring. Thanks. Thank you so much. Another successful series of events this fall were the fall parent socials. We raised $55,000 for PTA programs, but equally as important or more important, in my opinion, is that we came together as a community and everyone stayed safe. Now we're going to hear from a few other PTA volunteers. On election day, our kids headed to their own polls to vote in the Memorial Day logo contest. Shelly Closa runs that contest and is here tonight. Shelly? 
Yes, hello. It was an exciting election day for our for our young elementary students. Uh, as Mr. DiRienzo mentioned uh, earlier on, um, our students in elementary school are really encouraged to participate in the Memorial Day logo contest. Now, I know it's always kind of forward thinking, but it really gives a chance for students to really tap into their creativity um, and really help visualize some image or logo that embodies the spirit of the Bronxville school. And this image is used uh, in promotional and marketing materials the following year to help promote the Memorial Day celebration. Now this year, we actually had over 100 submissions across all grades, K through fifth grade, and each one was unique and used a range of design elements and experiment, experimenting with different materials and illustrations. Uh, those 100 submissions were narrowed down with the help of Mr. DiRienzo and the student council, council, and they were tasked to come up with the three finalists. And then again, it ultimately went to a, a student vote uh, to the entire elementary school and they were allowed to vote electronically and I believe also in paper maybe but we got the electronic vote down um, and they had to choose their preferred logo and I am extremely pleased to announce that this year's winner is a fifth grader Annie Vander Walker and her design was selected and uh, it'll be used throughout the year to promote the event so I encourage you to keep your eyes out for her winning design. And please, you know, continue to encourage your children to tap into their creative spirit and start thinking about their design ideas for next year. So back to you, Alana. Thank you, Shelley. Um, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee is holding a celebration of Diwali this coming Sunday. And Mike Brady is here to tell us about it. Mike? Thanks, Alana. Yeah, I, I'll just be real quick. And this has been terrific. Thank you so much for sharing all of the information. We, we've been doing some excellent events every month with the DEI committee to do what we suggest is encourage an environment where everyone at school feels heard and seen. Last month, we celebrated, <clears throat> excuse me, Hispanic Heritage Month with a Zoom panel discussing the movie Into the Heights or In the Heights. And this, uh, this month on Sunday, as you said, we're having a Diwali event where uh, it's family friendly for families and kids, or parents and kids to learn about Diwali and why some families in our community celebrate it. Great, thank you so much. Is there anything that people should know about? So, I mean, they've gotten emails, but how can people take part? Yep, so we've, uh, it's been, <clears throat> It's been the most successful event registration thus far. So we have 58 families, over 100 kids, 90% from the elementary school. Registration officially closed, but I got word from, uh, from uh, people in the know that if you email, I can put this in the chat, but it's dei at bronxvillepta.org. We can register whoever else would like to register. Great, thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Lastly, Christina Provenzano is here to tell us the latest from BOLD, the Bronxville Organization for Learning Differences. Christina? Thanks, Alana. Um, and just Arlene, I love what you said. I, I wrote it down. We want our students to learn to think, not what to think. I just, like I said, I wrote it down. Arlene, I just think that was great. Um, BOLD is a PTA group for parents of children with special needs. Our kids are either classified under an IEP or a 504 plan. The district does an amazing job supporting our kids. A few weeks ago, special education teachers presented to the BOLD Council and gave a comprehensive overview of the services the district provides. If you missed it, we archived it on our website. If your child is classified or if you're thinking about asking for a referral for your child, you will find this Zoom particularly helpful. You will see familiar faces and or those of educators that articulate the wide range of services available to support your kid. BOLD stands for Bronxville Organization for Learning Differences. And we have a social at Coles. 
at 6 p.m. next Thursday, uh, um, November 18th. <laughs> we have our bold conversations events on the calendar. The next one is in January. Feel free to come by on Zoom and have a conversation with us. We'll talk about the unique experiences our children have navigating school, as well as our own experiences as parents, realizing their vulnerabilities and our successful and not so successful attempts to support them. I hope to see you. Um, I hope to see our bold parents at Coles next Thursday and at our conversations in the future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Christina. That brings our meeting to a close. I don't see any other questions in our chat. Let me just see. Oh, there's a little more information on registering for the Diwali celebration, if anyone's interested. Um, wishing you all a good night and thank you again for taking the time to join us. I really appreciate it. Be well, everybody. Thank you.